Welcome to Champlain Maker Faire's Renewed Culture of Innovation, Makers on Screen. I'm your host, Doug Webster, and today's show is The Art of Making, Where Art and Technology Merge. The maker movement brings us together with tools and desire to improve the world around us. Since Champlain Maker Faire began in 2012, there has been a surge of interest in making, creation of maker spaces, and learning with new tools. My guest today is Jen Carson. She's with the College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences at UVM. Welcome to the show, Jen. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right. Good. <laughs> well, you wear many hats and have worn many hats in the maker movement. Can you tell us what you're up to these days? Sure. Um, well, uh, right now, um, I'm really excited about an exhibition that I was invited to be a part of, along with Kobe Brownell at Champlain College. Um, we worked with director Janie Cohen of the Fleming Museum, who, mm -hmm. who is also a Picasso scholar. And um, we have an exhibition that's up right now, and it'll be up through the end of May. It's called Staring Back, um, the, the Legacy and Creation of Les Demoiselles d'Avion. And so it's an interactive installation. Mm -hmm. It has sound and really interesting um, uses of digital technology to engage people in Picasso's creative process. Um, and then there's, uh, there's so much going on, too. I was just thinking about this. I mean, last week we were just at Makers in Montpelier. We just had right. our first meeting of the year, really, to get going for Champlain Maker right. Fair. Um, there's a lot of new, exciting outreach efforts and, and uh, combining with some like a history of outreach through the College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. Mm -hmm. um, so many programs always going on, but also some new programs happening this summer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, in terms of like what's really exciting and different about right now is just that we have, we've over the past few years, we've really built a foundation and, and found some really fantastic partners mm -hmm. um, to really start to bring, to bring even more this idea of making to more people. Great. Great. Now, you mentioned the, the Fleming Museum. Can yes. you uh, tell us a little bit more about that and what you hope to accomplish? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, what what the in terms of the outcome um, I guess still because I'm still it was so much work to make it happen yeah. um, but I were um, it was an exciting opportunity you know as an artist and maker to work with a Picasso scholar Janie mm -hmm. Cohen and to really think about how do we how do audiences um, engage with subjects in this day and age. But we're dealing with a subject that, you know, is over a hundred years old in terms of Picasso's process around this painting. So how do we create it, create something that's really lively and relative to mm -hmm. um, to visitors now? So I think in terms of we really wanted to create a visitor experience that um, where people could engage in an art process and the arts in a different way. And so far from what we've heard from people, it's, it has successfully done that. Mm -hmm. Now, can you tell us specifically what are the, the, the things that you, you did that Oh sure, yeah. yeah. So I I have two sound pieces in mm -hmm. the exhibition. Um, one that is um, the the painting when it was initially um, when Picasso initially painted it was very controversial, mm -hmm. and so we have a, there's a sound piece based on um, how shocked people were by that painting, mm -hmm. um, and that's using a and it's using a really interesting kind of sound technology, um, hypersonic sound that's highly directive. Mm -hmm. So even it, the way you experience the sound within the gallery is unique. There was also a, there's also another piece that is an exploration of what it was, what the sounds were like around Picasso's studio, mm -hmm. um, where he was he was living and working at the time, um, and it's also a, a reflection on the process of the of the artist from working in a very isolated setting on your own to when you actually go out into the public and and the um, how those relationships work together, um, and that's a wow. sound piece that was um, also that's created using a really, really fun software, um, Max MSP. Uh -huh. So that the, it's actually a dynamic recording. It doesn't always play the same way every time it's played through. Um, but at the same time, we use this really old speaker, um, actually an Edison horn. So that would have been from that time period around oh, cool. 1907. So it was this neat combination of high tech and low tech, but old and new technologies. Oh, neat. Now we have some uh, shots to show people yeah. here. Yep. Uh, let's take a look at those. Okay. And what what is this? Yeah, go ahead. Tell so us about. So this is the 
This right here is a part of the installation that is a dynamic video. Um, part of it is the, is the painting there depicted on the left, and then you've got Picasso's studio. And this digital version of the studio is based on um, another artist's work on what Picasso's studio looked like at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're in the gallery, you can see it moving. Um, so I was saying it was, uh, it's also about the, um, the legacy as well as the creation of Les Demoiselles d'Avion. And so there's contemporary works, which you see here, as artists reflecting on, contemporary artists reflecting on the work in, a tr in traditional 2D formats. And 3D, sorry, there's sculpture uh -huh. there too. That's the same with this part. Um, here you're seeing a piece, this is what Kobe worked on, where you actually hold an iPad up to um, different uh, par parts of the work on the, ga on the wall, and you're seeing different things depending on if you're uh, looking through the iPad or not. Um, and these are a ser what you're looking at here are a series of the sketches that led up to the painting. Uh, Picasso was, worked extremely hard on this painting. There are numerous, numerous studies and sketches, and you can actually see all of them within this exhibition with the help of using these, this new kind of technology. Wow. Um, so here, so she's, she's pointing at the painting, and she's seeing an earlier version, an uh, earlier sketch of the painting. Huh, okay. This part here, this starts to break down into the different um, parts of art history that really influenced Picasso. Um, and this is interactive as well. You can see how she has her hand over the sensor there so that you can browse through the different parts, uh, the different sections of information that might interest you. Okay. Um, here we're back in that other gallery. You can see the little sound spot on the floor. I was talking about the hyper-directional sound. So that's that sound. You can see, actually see the speaker at the top. You don't really see the speaker so much when you walk in, but that's like the sweet spot where you can hear the sound the best. It almost sounds like as if you were standing, you had headphones on when you're in that spot, but you, but you don't. Hey, before you go on, it, the iPad, how does that work? I mean, how do you get that previous sketch to come up? It was, you know, and Kobe did that project, um, but it's using a software that he's been working with for quite a while, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. But it's something that triggers. It actually triggers it. You just hold it up, and then boom, you get access to all those different groups of sketches. Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah, cool. it is cool. Now, there were some other picks up here. Thank yeah. You. Uh, this is the piece I was mentioning that has the very new Max MSP, um, the dynamic sound software, way in the back, but we have the sound coming out through this old speaker Edison horn. Oh, yeah. um, and then there's a piece on the left there, which is a, a video and kind of a time travel piece, where based on this, that's a picture of young Picasso um, within the time frame of when he was working on the painting. But it actually, we actually recreated that place using Google Maps and trying to identify exactly where he was. And we recreated part of it, which you can't see here right now, with a UVM student actually right in that same exact place. Um, and here's again, this is one of the, this is the uh, part of the interactive part, sensor driven part of the installation where you can look through and see the different parts of uh, the history, the art history that came before Picasso and what he yep. was influenced by. Um, this shot here, this is actually a map, was the mapping and research. This is from my studio wall that went into creating the sound collage I was talk talking about earlier that was based on trying to to figure out and then um, reproducing what it sounded like mm -hmm. in Picasso's neighborhood and from his studio, the different kind of sound, the soundscape he would have heard and experienced. Okay, cool. Great, great. Now, can you tell us uh, how long does that go through again? It's is through the end of May. Through the end of May. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah, at the Fleming Museum. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. It's really great. exciting and it's, uh, we've got really strong positive reactions from all ages. So, I mean, it's not for young kids, I would have to say that yeah, too. Yeah. Um, but it's, but um, I would say middle school and up. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to technology and art and, and so forth, what, what else can you say about that? Generally, what can you say about technology and art? And, you know, are there categories and can you ex talk about that for a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think when I first, when I explain to people how I do my work, what I usually say is, you know, you think of a painter um, that, who works with paint. And as an, mm -hmm. as an artist, you know, my material is technology. Um, and I'm certainly not alone. And um, there's a pretty rich history um, 
you know, that we can date back to as soon as video was around. Um, you could look at different artists who have worked with video, but with sound art in particular, yeah. you can go back as far as the futurists and the early 1900s who were really sort of celeb celebrating the, this, um, you know, industry and technology, and they were that, those were some of the first sound works that I am. I'm aware of, so it has mm -hmm. a it has maybe a marginal but a really rich history, um, and there are people who are real have been really invested in the subject for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. A publication I love is Leonardo, which comes out of MIT, um, and when you start when you read that art publication, you realize oh this is just going on everywhere, and it's really interesting. Mo Montreal even does a, an art fair that's focused on art and technology. Yeah. So I think yeah. sometimes when I'm I would say like sometimes when I'm talking to people, it's they may not, it may be kind of new to them, but there is a history to it and there are artists mm -hmm. who are very committed to the to it. Um, and I think if you think of, I think a lot of times we might think of art, what is art? And you're like, oh, well that's painting and that's drawing, but like there was a time when there was no photography. And so yeah. working yeah. in painting was like, that was really working in the medium of the day. So if you think about, well, what are, what are the material, what is material culture like now? What are the materials that are available pe to people for making? And then you look at it that way, and it's very, I think it seems very natural that artists would be working with technology yeah. because it's available to them. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where do you see it going with the, the new technologies that are emerging? They, of course, you're using Arduino devices and Raspberry yeah. Pis and all that. Yeah. But where do you see it going in the future? In in what types of art forms do you see it going into? Yeah. I mean, um, that's that's a great question. I think. I think I can probably really only speak for myself in that because yeah. it's going in so yeah. many different directions and you you know you've got people working you've got artists working with data now you've got of course artists working with video um, you've got some of the new technologies that are in the Fleming exhibition and then from my perspective you've got the sound so there and sound mm -hmm. technologies um, and then we've got microcontrollers and um, I think my my interest is really in that I think it opens up the interdisciplinary dialogue yes. um, yeah. and that that is what's most interesting to me um, because you, an artist can make with technology, but who else makes with technology? Well, engineers make with technology, for example. Um, yeah. It also can open up, I think, a conversation that can build more literacy around technology in, in terms mm -hmm. of like getting, of, of opening doors to the conversation about how is technology used? What are the possibilities of of working with technology? Okay. Now, what are ways uh, technology and art is promoted and propagated in, uh, within the systems that we have in, in our community? Well, I mean, that I mean that's another great question because you think of um, I know for artists it can be tricky because if you think about um, a lot of artists make their living off of mm -hmm. selling work. So when you're creating an, a just original pieces of artwork, that those are, those, the market handles those much more easily. You know, you buy a painting, you buy a, a drawing. Yeah. Um, but there are collectors who collect video. Um, and then there are installations that, that get collected as well. Um, but the, the, there, are, there are issues with storing um, their digital works, and there there are issues in that you know a lot of it that there's not the same kind of market to support the purchasing. Now, of them. now, what about schools, libraries, and that type of thing? You you, you do training in libraries and did that last summer, right? Yep. Can you talk a little bit about that and what? Yeah, so we did a series of programs which we call, which we were calling STEAM, so that's science, yep. technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, yeah. And that was a way of introducing new technologies, but also bringing in design and the creative process, like very clearly into that. So, mm -hmm. um, one example would be the um, the e textiles work that we were doing. So, so we were introducing kids the idea of circuits, of um, how a circuit works. Mm -hmm. um, they were even though they were working with conductive thread instead of wires. The the threads couldn't overlap in certain ways, but the way that we introduced all those materials to them was initially through a design process. So mm -hmm. they initially had to sit 
they had to draw out their design and there were parameters of what would work and what wouldn't work in yep. terms of how the lines could go but they had an idea in mind like for example maybe they wanted to create a cat whose eyes lit up so they would be thinking about that and the cat was totally their idea they could do whatever whatever they wanted um, and they're picking some colors that they want to work with so mm -hmm. they're getting introduced to the the technology as a material, but they're being given that creative freedom to really pursue and make something they want. Yeah. And we found that yeah. that was a very powerful teaching tool, brought a lot of kids, different kinds of kids, into wanting to make things and work with new technologies in, an, in a way that was not intimidating. Great. And it worked differently for different kinds of kids. Like, I think it worked for the kids who were like maybe more creative driven mm -hmm. like they want they had a thing particular thing they wanted to make but it also worked for the kids who maybe were more interested in how does this technology work sounds fantastic it was yeah <laughs> now we've got a uh, clip we, we want to show from Compli toy hacking yeah, right compliments across the fence yes right. thank you yeah. all right well let's let's take a look at that these are so you can get some batteries into your toy and make sure it works okay for kids, there's not much that's more exciting than playing with a new toy. I've seen this toy before. It's this thing where there's, um, you pull a lever and then an arrow spins around and it'll point at an animal and then um, a speaker will say, um, duck says quack quack. So to start, what we're gonna do is an investigation of our toys. What These kids do? aren't so excited to play with their new toys. They're the excited animals. to take the toys apart and see what's inside. When you first start to take the toy apart, you just see like this, pretty much, and you have to take the screws off of like, so you can go onto the inside and then you get to this part. And then there's still screws on this that I could just unscrew and then take this piece off. But technically you just see the, the toy before you see the insides. One of the teachers here had asked me, how do you think that works? And I'm like, some sort of um, angle sensor. And so it was kind of like that in a way, but kind of not. At this toy hacking workshop at the Deborah Rawson Memorial Library in Jericho, participants select a toy and become an expert in how it works. From the outside, in. And then you can do it all lowercase. We start with a toy that's a used toy, but it's been its off, off the shelf. All right, cool. All right. So, I uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, and, toy and who was there? You know, you had a mix of females and males, girls and boys. We did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was we had a we had a good gender balance for our programs. And the toy yeah. hackings did appeal yeah. a little more to boys than than girls. But um, so that was at. Um, the Deborah Rawson Memorial Library in Jericho, yep. a really fun place to be. And you can see there was like quite an age range there, um, middle school and a little bit younger. Um, yep. And the that was it. That was um, you know also the one of the it was the, the entry point was really easy I think for everyone or just very engaging of like just inviting the kids giving them a safe environment where they could just take apart a toy uh -huh. and like yeah. see how it works and then we would sort of coach them through trying to figure out how to maybe make the toy do something it wasn't intended to do again getting into sort of that design thinking part of yeah. it is like well what do you think this toy should do or but you know while you're figuring out what it does and one thing we always tell the kids which is absolutely true is that as soon as they've spent like five minutes with that open toy. They are the expert in the room on uh -huh. that toy, right, which right. I think is very inviting to them too, because it's like we're, we're saying like, now you tell, what are you learning? Tell us about what you've learned in this, because no one else in that room, I mean, it would be very unusual if anyone else in that room had opened up the toy that that particular kid yeah. was opening up. <laughs> yeah, you know, as far as the, uh, the ratio of, of girls and boys, uh, what do you see there? I mean, is, is it predominantly girls or predominantly boys? Or, well, you know, I what, think that uh, you know, generally in STEM, there's there is there's like there's concern that uh, not enough females are getting right. into the right. field or going yeah. into the programs. We've figured out a few different things through just the different kinds of workshops we do um, that help to create that balance. And I, like I was saying earlier, I think the STEAM, bringing in that arts element, that design element has been a huge help because you get, you just, I mean, and just even bringing in different kinds of kids, not right. just getting a more gender balance. Because you can have be approaching it versus like, I want to make this versus before you can even be intimidated by the technology part. Um, 
Uh, but the other thing I'm starting to notice a lot is like, for example, there's a sound mapping workshop that I'm doing as part of the exhibition at the Fleming. And so that was promoted through an arts venue. And the, already this, we can already tell that the, the class filled and the mm -hmm. gender ratio was really different. So I think sometimes it can depend on the, you know, how you title things. It can depend on the context of who's promoting it. The right. libraries right. were great too because, you know, actually some of the libraries were like, oh, this will be great to help us bring in more boys because they're used to having a more, um, you know, f women, uh, females and girls come into their library. Yeah. So it really can depend on the venue mm -hmm. can have a big say in that. Okay. Now, now as far as the mainstream arts community, how well are they uh, adopting technology and art? And, yeah. and are they, or, or why and why not? Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if I can answer that so broadly because I'm so embedded in this one particular scene where it's kind of like all we talk about or think about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would say that the reception to the Fleming in terms of the critical reception of it has been more positive than I would have anticipated, more open to it, even if they're like this, you know, this might, might not be for everybody. This is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, and I think um, the kinds of, I would still say like within the arts community, the kinds of questions people ask me, I think sometimes there can be some concerns about, well, how, you know, in art, a lot of people get attached to ideas of authenticity and, and it's hard for some people to see something that's digital as falling into something that is authentic, which they really connect to art. So I think there'll always be that tension there. Mm -hmm. um, but for those of us who are in it, you know, like even in when I was getting my MFA, which I got at the San Francisco Art Institute, which is a very progressive school, like we had yeah. our pocket, we were a new program and we had our pocket of it and we were all just totally engaged in it, but that didn't necessarily mean that um, some of the, you know, even professors or students in the more traditional fields were like accepting what we were doing as art. Um, but I think that for for those uh, those of us who engage in it, it's an it, we get enough support to just sort of run with it. Yeah, yeah. Now, what got you into the maker movement in the first place? Well, when I was I always mentioned I was in San Francisco for art school, and actually that was my first maker fair was in two thousand and eight. Um, and what I loved about it right away, and I was taking, um, I was studying sound technology, so I was introduced to the Arduino right away. Um, and then I went to the, the a maker fair there, and what I loved about it, and it, what I loved about my instructor who was teaching me this was the openness of the maker mm -hmm. movement and being like, this is, uh, we want to bring everybody in, whereas the arts community can be somewhat exclusive sometimes. Yeah, and, um, yeah. and so I was like, wow, this is, this is fantastic, like it's so open and inviting. Um, and then I was just loved the technology as well. So um, when I came back to Vermont, I was like, you know, this is my thing. I wonder if there's other people here interested. And we just started, that was when like the first tweet went out, seeing if anyone would be interested in creating an Arduino club, which right. promptly turned into Vermont Makers, and that was 2011. Um, and so in terms of Vermont, you know, seeing, Go, there was a year there, I would say actually even in 2010 when I first got back and I'd be like, mention the Arduino and mention what I was doing and people were like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, right, and then right, something right, just changed yeah. about the time that we met. Right, right. <laughs> you know, where it was like still really small and marginal, but you could start to see that there was acceptance and interest and we saw that in attendance to Vermont Makers programs and then the first Maker Fair, which was like a huge success despite right. it being like right. totally new and like a terrible rainy, rainy cold day, day. <laughs> like the worst weather you could ever ask for in September or was it October? Yeah, remember. September that time, end of September. So well, yeah, yeah, so the community has been so welcoming and I saw, and I felt like I saw that again with the Fleming show because I wasn't really sure how that was going to go over. Yeah. Yeah, so when, when I first called you and told you we were doing a Maker Faire, <laughs> uh, what, what was your reaction to that? I mean, you think it was like, you know, we didn't have enough makers in this community, or oh, did you no, think we I, were? That, I, well, I was really excited right away, and that I could, yeah, like, I was yeah. like, yeah, there's going to be Maker Fair in Vermont. I want to be a part of that yeah, great, right away. Great. Awesome. I think we like initially like we've all we all really were supported by each other's enthusiasm. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Crazy enthusiasm. And, and you know, it did seem natural <laughs> that Vermont would have makers. Like it always have felt like it was a good fit in terms of the DIY spirit here. 
um, yeah, and the, that right. really you could go back to like f to just family farms or if you if something you want to fix something you got to figure out how to fix it on you your own. Do it yourself. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Now, what do, where do you see the maker movement going in general? You know, around the world and all that. Where, oh. What do you think the future of the maker movement is? Um, well, I think we're definitely, there's more, there seems, you know, there's, there's momentum uh, that's yeah. building and interest. Um, I think that the maker movement is starting to have an in, influence on bringing a new, uh, like a renewed credibility to working with your hands right. um, in right. different ways. But also, like, I think we find, I think different people, in, 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 even in academia, too, like we're looking back at the tradition of tech centers and like really and being like, let's like these have these have always been really valuable skills. Maybe they've been set aside for a while and not prioritized. But yeah, that we like this and we want more of this. Right. So right. I think that there's a nice coming together of like sort of this the what the maker movement is bringing to maybe some appreciate some things that have always been there but in a new light and then we've got these like new very these technologies that are just accessible in totally new ways right so right. i th hope i think there's an opening i get a i hope that it the thing that's most interesting to me is about uh, you know it's not necessarily that everybody becomes an engineer or a computer scientist but that we have more literacy about how things are made with technology because we're all users of right. technology at this point and it's fine to be a user it's great to be a user like we love our technology but it's really important to know how it works yeah. um, because yeah. in some ways you know we're we're controlled by this technology as well now now the uh, UVM uh, engineering has a fab lab. Can you talk about that a little bit? Oh, the bit? fab lab, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, so I supervise the Vermont fab lab. Right. And um, this right now, it's a, a student, students run it. We have undergraduate students who are running the lab and working with their peers to help them do projects um, that are affiliated with the curriculum through the College of Engineering and Mathematical yep. Sciences. Um, and the, we have a combination of, you know, really high-end high 3D printing and then desktop 3D printing. Um, and we have a laser cutter, we have a laser scanner, and so we have students helping students prototype and fabricate fabricate with these new tools. Right, right. So is art kind of working its way into the engineering? It, it is. A little, yeah, we actually yeah. have an art class right now that we're working with. Um, it's a printmaking class, and they're doing um, wood etchings on our laser cutter, and they're using those to create prints. Yes, yes. And now one last question here, and then we're going to have to close here. Okay. Uh, but when it comes to K-12 education, where do you see that going? in terms of uh, the maker movement, art and engineering, and, and so forth? Well, I think that the, I think that with, there's, so there's a next generation science standards and engineering um, that have come out. And I think that the maker, getting the idea of making and the maker movement sort of into that mix opens mm -hmm. up the possibility for teachers from different disciplines to teach making. Um, I think when you're, maybe if you're thinking really specifically about engineering design, sometimes that's falling a lot to the science teachers. But right. when you bring in the making, that can be a lot of different kinds of teachers. That can be art teachers. It could be, you know, you've got your tech educators, you've got your, um, you know, your tech centers, and you've got your science teachers and math teachers, um, and you've got your, basic classroom teachers, you know, again, because I think there's a way of introducing these things where you're speaking more to a literacy um, right, and, right. and that, and going, and, and a literacy that does involve like jumping through hoops that maybe you're not used to jumping through, but then are worth it in the end because you've been able to achieve an idea. Great, great. Well, well, thank you for being on the show, oh, John. Oh, really thanks for having me, it. Doug. Great. <laughs> Today's show was The Art of Making, Where Art and Technology Merge. And our guest today was Jen Carson. And Jen is with the University of Vermont's College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences. For more information about this show, related internet links, and other shows in this series, go to retn.org and look for Makers. Also, for more information on art and making, go to studiojuju.com. That's J-U-J-U, -J -U. and vermontmakers.org. Thank you for being with us.